it's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 26th Freedom Lecture here at the Bali. My name is Chris Keine. I'm a foreign editor for VPRO Radio, and I may be your host tonight. There's chaos in Venezuela, a country that once belonged to the richest countries of South America has fallen into a deep crisis, as you probably know. As for the causes of that crisis, we'll come to speak about that, but the facts are the economy has collapsed, food is scarce, and due to a serious shortage, there's no medicine or medical staff available. Pharmacists have to send patients away empty-handed. During this 26th Freedom Lecture, the Venezuelan activist Efrim Vegas will speak about the deplorable human rights situation in Venezuela and his personal experiences in the last decades under the Bolivarian Revolution, as the Chavez and subsequently Maduro regimes have dubbed their socio-political experiment that seems to have gone so gravely off the rails now. In the documentary that's being screened during uh, the Movies That Matter festival, Estat Todo Bien, which means like everything okay here, um, we see how Efrain Vegas risks his life trying to smuggle medicine into the country. We're really happy and honored that we have this very special and brave guest here in our midst, a man who put his life and career on the line to try and help out, who left his country not to flee, but to share his experiences here with us and with the wider world, and therefore is not sure if he will be able to go back to Venezuela after his talk here today. Efrain Vegas is 31 years old. He was born in Caracas, Venezuela's capital, and in 2012 he graduated from the Universidad Central de Venezuela as a medical doctor. And he was the president of the Students' Society of the Jose Maria Vargas School in 2009. Since 2015 he worked together with different NGOs and he worked as a traumatology and orthopedics assistential resident in several hospitals and was president of the Residents Medical Society of the Hospital Universitario de Caracas in 2017 and 2018. He worked there until, and I quote, I was fired by the dictatorship for making public the situation in the hospital. As said, tonight Efrain Vegas will share his vision on the current state of affairs in Venezuela on the meaning of freedom. He will speak about his experiences in smuggling medicine and his ideas on freedom, hope, and resistance. After that speech, we will have a panel conversation with Nina Jurna. She's the correspondent for Latin America for NSA Handelsblatt, one of the big Dutch dailies. Uh, she's based in Rio de Janeiro, but she traveled a lot to Venezuela, mostly in recent months, but also in the years before. <laughs> Uh, another uh, panel member is Edwin Koopman, former correspondent in the region and also a foreign editor at VPRO Radio and an analyst in the field of Latin America. And we have Rachel Ruma Diaz, Ruma Diaz and she's a poet and a spoken word artist of both Venezuelan descent and with roots in Curaçao. Um, I have to thank our sponsors, VFund and Democracy and Media Foundation for making this evening possible, and for Movies That Matter, with whom we cooperated to make this program. Before I introduce the first speaker of tonight, we would like to show you a compilation of images that illustrate the current situation in Venezuela. <laughs> 
It's a cry for drugs, patients, health professionals and human rights activists, all demanding their government find a way to bring medicine to Venezuela, a country where surging prices and severe shortages are devastating for people who are HIV positive. Venezuela used to be Latin America's wealthiest country, but Caracas residents have demanded access to a supermarket even if the shelves were empty because of a shortage of food. Medicina! Medical patients have protested a shortage of medicine, and children play in the dark because of a shortage of power. It's been an economic freefall, the product of falling oil prices and failed economic policies. Bills have become so worthless, women turn them into art. Inflation could hit 10 million percent. All of it sparked the region's largest ever exodus. More than three and a half million Venezuelans have fled their homes and created a humanitarian crisis that increased regional criminality. This is one of the country's biggest hospitals. It has capacity for 1,200 people. They're looking after just 170. And looking after them is literal. They aren't being treated. There is nothing at all. They spend days and weeks just lying here. As the situation continues to deteriorate, patients are wondering when their voices will be finally heard and questioning how many more people will die before politicians find a way for them to get their medicine. So for our first speaker who will introduce uh, Efrim Vega's Freedom Lecture, please welcome Nina Yona. Good evening. There is no story that touched me more as a journalist than what happened the last few years in Venezuela. A few weeks ago, I stood among thousands of volunteers, Venezuelans and Colombians, at the Colombian border city of Cucuta, as they desperately tried to get trucks full of humanitarian aid across the border. Men, women and children clung to the trucks and were prepared to take the most dangerous risks to get the products, food and medicines, which are so desperately needed in Venezuela, over the Simon Bolivar Bridge. On the other side of the bridge, there were soldiers of Maduro's army who stopped trucks from entering the country. There was no need, said Maduro, but above all, he did not want American or Western aid. According to Maduro, it was a part of a coup attempt driven by the American pawn Juan Guaido, the Congress leader that declared himself interim president. With tear gas and rubber bullets, the desperate but very fanatic people were attacked and they responded with stones and Molotov cocktails. Before my eyes, I saw a 14-year-old boy get seriously injured. Later, he died in the hospital. A woman yelled from the truck that she was ready to die as long as the help went through the border, across the border. We will die without the medication anyway, she said. Our country must be freed and I'm willing to give my life for it today. While I was in the scales and panic situation, trying to, trying to do my job, describing what was happening and interviewing people, I asked myself, how far do I go in taking risks? I realized that after years of work in Venezuela and, numbering, uh, and numerous background reports and interviewing shoes across the country, the story I covered for so long now had become a true battlefield. This was war. In 2016, I stumbled across long rows in front of supermarkets and pharmacies. I needed a backpack for the huge packs of heavily devaluated bolivars. On that visit, I met Paula, a single mother who lives with her daughters in Petare, a slum between the fast Avila mountains. During the day, she works as an assistant on the local district office. 
In the evening, she cleans houses for rich people. Her daughters stand in, long, stand in long lines in front of supermarkets after school to buy food. As the crisis in Venezuela takes on larger forms and the country collapses further, Paula's living situation becomes more and more critical. She and her daughters eat only a few times a week, just like most Venezuelans do. They have lost more than 10 kilos on average due to the crisis. Her daughters scream as they unpack a suitcase. I carried one visit full of groceries, like rice, beans, soap, and toilet paper. Paula's eye shines as she takes the goodies out of my suitcase. I had to manage it with difficulty to get the full suitcase to the Venezuelan customs. Working as a journalist in a country in need makes you feel connected to the reality of the people and gives you a feeling of responsibility. Every time I left Venezuela, I took a bit more of the country home. From the people I met and from all the misery I've seen. How different to 2005 when I first came there and worked in the glory years of Chavez when the oil business was booming. I want to give the oil back to the people, said Chavez, who, with his ideals from the Bolivarian Revolution, nationalized the oil industry and other companies and promised the poor a better future. I remember in those days an interview with a woman in the Katia slump who had never attended school but could now stu study law through one of Chavez's social education projects in the slums. This was always my dream, she said. I want to become a lawyer. But the cult surrounding Chavez took larger forms, huge billboards of him in the streets of Caracas, and pressure on free journalism and human rights increased. Independent channels were closed, visas for foreign journalists were suspended. When I entered the country, I had to invent stories like a family visit or my made-up love. The police usually checked the phone list of my hotel and ask if I was in touch with the opposition. Venezuela is for me the most stressful and dangerous South American country to work in. After Chavez's death, the crisis intensified. Mismanagement, low oil prices, corruption, more nationalization, sanctions, it all resulted in shortages of medicine and food and more than three million refugees to neighboring countries such as Colombia, Brazil, but also Aruba and Curaçao, part of the Dutch Kingdom. Desperate people pay $300 to enter the islands, crossing the dangerous Caribbean Sea on small fisher boats. Many die during these trips. Paula, the single mother from Petare, lost one of her oldest daughters in 2017 because there was no insulin to find. In the GM de los Rios Hospital in Caracas, once the best children's hospital, I saw children suffering from malnutrition. I remember a boy, Wilfredo Hernandez, 12 years old, with a weight of only 15 kilos. My son had the same age at that time. I deeply respect doctors like Mr. Ephraim Vegas, thank you for being here, who try to do everything under these circumstances to save people's lives. Now is the time, Juan Guaido told me, the 30, 30, 21st of January, two days before the Congress leader proclaimed himself interim president, based on the possibility in the Constitution. The young politician realized the risk and the danger, but he had to do it, he said. But where are we now, two months later, after his proclamation? American aid was stopped at the border where people died and the big desertion of Maduro's army didn't happen. Did Guaido lost his momentum? Will the process of change take much longer than was expected? Or is it at the end just a matter of time? 
And is Maduro only able, able to survive until there is money to buy the loyalty of the army and until he has the support of China and Russia? Don't forget us, said Paula when I phoned her last week. A message more important than ever and relevant in this huge humanitarian disaster which is not over yet. And now please give a warm hand for Mr. Ephraim Vegas. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Movie That Mario Film Festival Amnesty International and the Dutch people for this honor for being here. I want also to give thanks to Tuki Henkel, the movie director that believes our work in Venezuela is important enough to make a movie. Uh, first, we are going to show you some fragments of the movie. Uh, so you, if you can put the, the fragment to this. Hace 30 años atrás, cuando vivíamos nosotros en Venezuela, Cualquier profesional de tu edad ya tenía un carro comprado de agencia y ya había comprado un apartamento o había dado la cuota inicial de un apartamento. Cualquier profesional con 30 años y con 5 años de trabajo como tienes tú ya tenía un proyecto de vida cristalizado y estaba caminando hacia el éxito de una manera indetenible. Por eso es que no, no podemos resignarnos a lo que está pasando en el país. Está fertilizando la salud en Meria y en Venezuela, son ustedes. Hoy deciden hacer una huelga de hambre como médicos para poder exigir insumos al hospital universitario de la ciudad de Los Ángeles. Yo no sé dónde naciste tú, hermano, pero aquí muchos merideños nacimos en ese mismo H1 que hoy ha presentado a la fecha 80 neonatos que se han muerto porque no hay insumos en el hospital. Ya el medicamento es culpa de mucha gente probablemente y el que termina pagando el plato roto es el médico, que es el que se enfrenta al paciente y le da la cara. Well, there, there are some fragments of the movie. You can see the two more screenings on the Move That Matter Festival. So if you want to see all the movie, it's about like five activists in Venezuela that, like, that are fighting for human rights actually right now. While I was preparing this lecture, I wasn't even sure whether I would be able be even make into the Netherlands. Because the power blackout the last six days, I had to write this like our national hero Simon Bolivar used to write 200 years ago with a candlelight. I began my activism when I was a medical student at Venezuela Central University, whose motto is the house that defeats the shadow. This title was earned because of the resistance to the dictatorship in 1950s, was launched from my alma mater. Almost five decades, decades later, when Chavez decided to not renew broadcast li license of RCTV, the major television network, the student movement was born in Central University. It became the opposition force to be renowned with, and Juan Guaido, also a student at this time, was one of its leaders. I was also a member of the movement, and two years later, I was elected as president of the student council of the School of Medicine, Jose Maria Vargas School of Medicine. After graduating in 2013 as a medical doctor, I started my practice in a rural town called Sanare, that actually means healing. A year later, I returned to Caracas to do my postgrade degree in trauma surgery. As a part of my studies, I had to make a ward on Hospital Periférico de Coche. That is where, where the movie was filmed uh, in, a dangerous, in a very dangerous neighborhood in Caracas. During this time, I was not un unusual to receive 
up to 10 gunshot wounds patients per shift. Some days, we had neither morphine or other painkillers. On those days, we had to cut the patient cloth out to do on sterilized tourniquets. It was also the time when the government started to employ FIAS, the elite police unit that carry out the death squads in my country. Initially, intent to curb the crime. Were very active in the vicinity and I could identify their victim because they all have point blank bullet wounds. More recent, recently, the unit has been known to target political dissidents on poor and poorest neighbors in Venezuela. One night during a shift, uh, uh, 14 years old with several shots in the, on his chest was delivered. We had, we had nothing at all at, in, that, in that moment in the, in, the, in the hospital, so we have nothing to treat him. No painkillers, no gas, no solution, nothing to stop the bleeding even. We have nothing to do at all. I felt so help, helpless in that moment that I ended up crying for hours in the arms of his mother. She had to see her son die of a horrible, agonizing death. The hospital periferico of Coche was eventually closed because of electrical failure and it still remained closed till this day. It has been six years, six months long. I continued my post-grade internship at the university hospital. Medicine supplies were getting increasingly scarce. With the help of several, several of my colleagues, we start to smuggle medicine into the NGOs and inside the hospitals and give these medicines to our patients. This was highly risk because we were, if we were caught with a stash of medicines inside the hospital, the authorities could accuse, accuse, accuse us for stealing hospital resources and hoarded, hoarding some mock of charges that could lead us to dismissal. In 2017, my fellow postgraduate students decided to elect me as the president of the Society of Residents of Internal Doctors at the, hospi at the University Hospital. It was a very tough year for me and my family. I was victim of a homicide attempt. My wife, also a resident doctor, was beaten by some family members because a patient who died due to the lack of medicine, basically a basic anti antibiotic that is in every single hospital. Some colleagues of mine were abducted by secret police to punish them for making public statements. My laptop and medical equipment were stolen too, more than once. My email was hacked and my personal information was deleted because, because this stress during this time, my wife lost two pregnancies. In February 2008, there was an outbreak of di diphtheria inside the hospital the, the, a disease that until then had been eradicated in my country. Since there was no available vaccines on the hospital, both my wife and I got the, this illness. It was, then, then was when I wrote my resignation letter as president of the Society of Resident Internal Doctors and I want to read a part of that letter to you. In a hospital institution that for the past two days had no X-ray, service more than eight months without functioning laboratory and where patients are expected to buy their own supplies from gloves to antibiotics or painkillers so they can get a surgery. A hospital infected by pigeons, rats, cockroaches and other vectors in, in all its areas, areas. A hospital with more than 30 people in the state of denutrition who have made surrounding areas their home defecating in the parking lot and burning trash for cooking. A hospital that claims to be a national reference for infection diseases like diphtheria and measles, and we have not even the working staff have been vaccinated as precautionary measure. An institution where workers from the dorm to the specialist doc from the dormant to the specialist doctors are going to bed hungry as they make less than $2 per month. A hospital with more than 70% of its surgery rooms not operative as a result of malfunctioning equipment. A hospital with a structural faults where light and water services are intermittent. 
a hospital with ethnical crisis, including accusations of prostitution, drug, drug selling inside the hospital, and shield trafficking in its hallways. To this, we need to add the indolent attitude of the authorities who have been refusing to meet with doctors of the institution. And when we approach them on the hallways, they walk with their bodyguards, shrug off, off saying that it's a temporary situation. In spite of all this, we're still trying to resolve the crisis internally. But all we get was a response, our threat to revoke our degrees or to attack us. The situation leads me to hand my registration letter as president of the society, as I cannot give my concrete answers to my colleagues and even less to our patients to who we own our duty. After this letter was made public, it went viral, and I was promptly fired from the institution. With a stroke of a pen, I lost four years of practical studies in traumatology, and they denied me my postgraduate degree. After that, I closed down my social networks, I stopped making public statements, and I continued my activism from the underground till this day that I'm speaking out loud in front of you and in front of the world to tell people around the world how badly we are doing in Venezuela. And we can make a lot of things with, with a little. So please be aware of what is happening in Venezuela. And thank you for listening to me and having me here at Amsterdam. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's better. Um, thank you very much for your. Hope you understand my words. Yes, we yes. did. You did, didn't you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you for your bravery to start with. How important is it for you to to have this lecture here? Uh, I think it was like the ver the most important thing I ever do in my life because like. I received this invitation from the Valley like uh, 15 days ago. Ah. I was having a very bad time during the power shortage. The shortage we were living in Venezuela. There were like a lot of people looting around the house. Oh. And my family, my wife, and, and me were, were very scared about the situation, you know? Yeah. So it was like a light in the end of the tunnel. I told my wife that I have to make this. It was like a, a feeling. And since I, since I arrived here, Holland, Dutch people had treated me very well. Uh, I think I, I, I was like a, a little bit late for this because the situation is from 20 years from today, but mm. it's now the moment, you know? It's the moment where the world turns his head to Venezuela and are, are start really taking uh, actions to do something about it, you know? Yeah. It's, it's our moment and we have to make it. So Dutch people basically inspired me to, to tell the truth and kind of protect myself, you know? You offer me like protection to telling about the truth, to talking out loud. I think I, I take this step forward because what's important, the doctors start, start telling out loud what's happening in Venezuela. If I do this in my country, I actually get in jail or killed or something worse than that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you say you, you, you left your family, your wife, yes. uh, in a situation that uh, was scary. Yes. Uh, what was it like to leave the country, to leave your wife in that situation? Well, it's a very difficult situation because they have like a power shortage today. They have like a 15 day without water. Uh, they have like but they have like uh, having a really bad time this now. Uh, my wife is like hiding in some place uh, there in Venezuela. She's like waiting to get out of Venezuela any soon. Is she also hiding because you are giving this lecture this, this and lecture you don't and know what the consequences are? Yes, yes. She's hiding because of the consequences that this will bring to me. But we're prepared for these consequences. We are like a being hopeful of, of the situation, we are, we are, we are making the, the denouncement, you know? Mm. And the complaint, the formal complaint with, with, 
with you, with the Dutch people, with, with the Hague, with the international court, we have to talk, we're going to talk to wh whatever we have to talk. Mm -hmm. And well, basically that's what I'm doing here in, in the Hague, yeah. in, Amster in Amsterdam and in, and in Holland. Yeah, the, the reason you're here, of course, is because you're in the film. Okay. Um, and that's how people from the Bali came to know about you. Okay. Um, how, dangerous, how dangerous is it that that film has been made? Uh, the film, making the film was uh, really dangerous for me uh, from Tuki. Also for the other NGOs, activists that appear on the movie. Tuki is the director. He's Tuki the Hanko, he's, he's here. Yes. He's filming. He's filming right now. <laughs> <laughs> Tuki is the movie director. He took a lot of risks to make the movie because we were like spies in those days. We were like uh, hiding from the government to see us doing that because it was like a, a crime in, in my country to tell the truth and to to make some good journalists about about a, a government issue can can't get you in jail, you know, or mm. killed. Mm. But well, he take the risk. I take the risk of uh, speaking out loud and, and telling the truth about what's, what was happening on our country. Our country guarantee the health right on the constitution and, and it's, it's, it's supposed to be universally for everybody. Uh, and it isn't, mm. it isn't for nobody. No. Has so, the film uh, been screened? In Venezuela? No, it hasn't no. been screened. Really? I think I think it won't. It won't, won't be. be. Where has it been screened so far? I mean, is is it known in Venezuela that the film has been made? Uh, yes, I think Venezuelan know because Venezuelan people is like really in Venezuelan team, in in Venezuela situation and looking for information everywhere. But I think it's ha it's have it has not been screened on on a public theater or something like that, you know. Mm -hmm. And it would would be projected until. Everything changed in the country. Yeah. There has, hasn't there been any uh, reaction from the authorities to the fact that that film has been made so no. far? So I like kind of move uh, faster than them. So I, I'm not going to be able to come back to my to my country and see what happened to me, because they can cut past me a lot of bad things. You know, hmm. I'm not going to take that risk with my family, and I think I am going somewhere else uh, to to deal with my activity, you know, like, like with my labor, like an activist. I have to, to make this, this activism to put people in, in touch and to get a better, better working about solving the, cli the crisis or helping in the crisis because the yeah. crisis can, can be solved with, with our work, you know. There are more than 100 activists right now in Venezuela that are working on this team. Mm -hmm. They are working in, in a lot of fields. Uh, there are like more than 100 uh, NGOs actually working in Venezuela, including the uh, International Red Cross. But when the humanitarian aid uh, became a political flag, it's like uh, they start looking back to the NGOs that start persecuting us. So was basically why we, we Francisco, make the decision to go Francisco is one of your colleagues in the oh, film. Yeah. Yes, the one that actually, like, he was the director of the of a very important NGO. I start, I start like working with him, like by making the classification of the medicines he got and the materials they got because they were they were were not uh, doctors and they don't know no. for what was each medicine. You know. As for as for the the the. the the, the smuggling of the medicine. Yes. What can you tell us about it? Where where do the medicines come from, and okay. how how do you organize it? Well, uh, basically, the the medicines come from to door to door services, like uh, from the from the ports from the from the ports of Venezuela. They like came in, uh, in boat from many countries, including the European Union, uh, the United States, Canada. Uh, France, uh, mostly France from the European Union. Uh, they are like taking, uh, like you see, you can see when you see the movie, they are like taking in in small pieces, so the government can get get a catch of a lot of medicine when they cut some some of those. Uh -huh. And they were like uh, enter, entering the, the the country by legal way in the patient's batch or suitcase. They take a lot of medicine inside the country. Uh, but basically, there are donations, small donations that aren't, aren't enough to fill the, fulfill the, 
the, the needs we have in yeah. Venezuela. Yeah. How dangerous was it to do that? It uh, was a lot of danger. Sometimes the uh, military like, understood our work and does not harm us. But sometimes they get pretty angry about what, what we were doing, our, about our work. And they start like, threatening us and, and like, trying to take us away from the activity. You know? mm -hmm. uh, what, what form does a threat take? How do they threaten you? Even they can put, put out a fire, a fire weapon and put it into your mouth or your head or, or your chest and tell, hey, shut it, shut up and don't tell nothing about nothing and go to your house, go to a study, go to make other, other thing and let the government be, you know? Mm -hmm. They could be some verbal arrest or some well, my wife was beaten from, for some family patient that were like Maduro regime supporters and they like get crazy when the patient died, start hitting her, scratching her. They like took her from the hair and, and was taken out of the, of the emergency room, you know? It was a very difficult time at that moment. My wife has like post-traumatic stre stress symptom and she like have to take some vacation so she chose sick and started seeing patients again, okay? Mm -hmm. It was like a, a, very, a very difficult time back in then. Uh, even if she was pregnant, and we, because of the stress that made the, this persecution to us, uh, she lost the pregnancy. We, we ran a lot of tests, and she was completely healthy. But the gynecologist said that it was about the stress that she lived with this, this persecution. In the movie, you also see that in my car, there is a hole on my, on my door. On my on my car's door, mm. that was some night that national guard shoot me. Uh, during my my, I was going to my last rural shift in Sanare, and they shoot me to stop the car and like to rob my my things. In Venezuela last year I had I have been robbed four times. I lost four cell phones. So in the movie, you're going to see a lot of new cell phones on me, but it's new, <laughs> isn't that a, I'm was like a rich man buying cell phones. It's like every th three or four months, they steal my phone with a, with a handgun. Huh. Yes, yeah. inside you, the hospital. You've also worked in uh, a smaller village outside of Caracas, yes. uh, six hours from Caracas, and you, you told us that, that when you were working there, which was in fact with, with the poorest people of, uh, of Venezuela, of Venezuela. Um, you also were threatened. What kind of threats were that? Well, the, I was going to my last shift on Sanare when I was uh, like a star speaking out loud what, ha what was happening. Uh -huh. Back, in, back in, in the 2013, I think, uh, or fourth thing. Uh, on those years, uh, I start a meeting with Francisco Valencia, Feliciano Reyn, and all the NGOs activists. And I was like one of the first doctors that publicly says that there was a uh, humanitarian crisis. When I first said it in like a Provea speech like this, uh, uh, it went viral because people start is telling me through the social network that I was overreacting, uh. that I was exaggerating the situation to make, to make me famous or something like that, and here I am, hmm. six years later in The Heck, in Amsterdam, telling you that it was a real situation. Uh. It's getting worse every day. Now, see, it's a, a complex situation because back in six years ago, we have more, more doctors than, than we have now, because more, more than 20,000 Doctor already flew Venezuela, already escaped from Venezuela. Can you understand why uh, a government, which uh, for for all the time that uh, since since uh, the Bolivarian Revolution started, has taken a lot of pride in uh, having a good health care, especially good health care for for the poor. Yes. Um, why it would be opposed to doctors to arrange medicine? The only thing that Maduro regimes do, do good is like international relationships and making a lot of lies, you know? They are very good saying lies and making propaganda about the lies, you know? They say a lot of things and they do nothing about Venezuelan situation, about Venezuelan crisis. In Venezuela, there is like a corrupt will where the, where the ministries get medicines and get rid of medicines so they can have more money to steal more. You know, so they bought the, the medicines very cheap at China or somewhere else. And during the, the transportation to Venezuela, they throw the, 
the cargo the, the, the carga to, to the sea, you know, to get rid of that medicines. They also, Carlos Rotondaro, one of the social security president for 11 years, just says Guaido was president and starts talking bad about the government. He also admitted that Venezuela uh, government hide medicines during electoral times, so they can, uh, when the electoral time comes, they can them. distribute them and make propaganda with the medicines. Mm -hmm. Imagine that situation. You said um, you have you have suffered uh, from the situation uh, for the last 20 years yes. under the. Um, the, the General opinion is that things have been deteriorating after uh, Chavez died and when Maduro took over. Um, what's your estimate of, of the beginning of the Bolivarian Revolution? Uh, at the beginning, we start like uh, losing our free, our freedoms, uh, like partially. They like don't make everything at the same time. They they were like very intelligent in that point. They were like playing chess, you know. They move one piece. Uh, further, then they tr take this this piece a little bit backwards, and then they throw something uh, forward. Uh, so they make it like very very with with white gloves, you know, mm -hmm. very carefully. They were they know where what were they make their way. Well, I'm sorry, no, they know no. what were we making, you know. The they were very, very aware of, who that, of what were they were They were making. very strategic in... Strategic in what they are making, right? And mm -hmm. they like use oil, the income of oil, to be like uh, recognized everywhere. They like uh, give a lot of people money to, to bribe them. And it's a very, it's a very difficult, difficult situation by now because like people that they bribe are still supporting them, you know? And people do not know, do not realize that, that we are in a very bad situation right now. Can people still not realize that the situation in Venezuela well, is bad? Well, uh, uh, I think there is a lot of people that uh, do not want to see the reality of Venezuela. You know, like there, we are telling. But an empty shop is an empty shop. Yes. You can't deny it, can you? But you can like. Uh, make people look uh, look to other way, you know. That's part of the Maduro strategy, to make the clowns so people get uh, like distracted with the situation, you know, and doesn't think about our real problems. It's like there has there have always been like, like that, you know. Chavez and Maduro make the clowns so people start talking about what they are making and not what people of Venezuela are suffering, you know. Did anything good come from uh, the Chavez revolution? Because we also hear about the free health care, the free education, okay. uh, millions of people taken out of poverty. Okay, the free health care isn't there anymore because there is no health care at all. The free education is no longer at there because the professor flew away and escaped because they were starving. And what was the other thing you tell me? Uh, millions of people, millions taken, of out people of taken to the poverty. Out of poverty. The opposite, okay? yes. Into the poverty. Mm -hmm. Like eight million people get into the poverty, including me. Mm -hmm. It's all the opposite. That the, 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 the government probably makes propaganda about the opposite thing that they, they were making right in Venezuela. So it's all the opposite. But you're talking about the situation now. Has it never been better? It has never been better. They were, made, they were making a lot of propaganda with a lot of money and made people think that they were very good, but they were, they were not in, in, in none of these 20 years. They have never been a good people with Venezuelan people, with Venezuelan population, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, they have never been good. Uh, I think like uh, from the 20 years of, of revolution, uh, economic index only uh, uh, take a rise in 2002, 2003. And then it goes down, down away. The petrol production, the, the gas production in Venezuela dropped like 80% during these years. We, like, uh, we produce 3.2 million barrels of petroleum when Chavez arrived, and now we produce less than 700, 700 million uh, barrels a day. And they don't have to where to sell it because the Americans make like a, some kind of a restriction of, 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 of financial restriction to the government, no? So, well, 
things are going bad, bad, bad in Venezuela. They are still there. They are still with a lot of, of founding because they get it from the drug and the gold and coal and everything they are taking out of, of Venezuela's southern lands. They are destroying uh, some, some beauties uh, of Venezuela. They're destroying the, the environment to take out coal and gold and all you can take from the soil. And what, on a fundamental level, do we think is the reason for that destruction? Because by de destroying their country, yes. they will, in the end, destroy themselves. Yes. Uh, I think it's mostly about the money. It's easy money. It's about uh, getting quick uh, benefits from be uh, a really quick profit about the, the business. And it's the cheapest way of, of making money and the, 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 the faster way of making, making so big, big quantity of money, you know? There are like expensive things they can sell. Uh, they actually uh, move gold to the, to the Holland Antiques, to the Holland Island because uh, from there they can move it around the world. And to the, Curaçao. To Curaçao and or Aruba. Aruba. They made with the gold jewelry and they like fl fly from Venezuela to Aruba, Curaçao, Bonaire, and then uh, in the other side they take that away the jewelry and they make the laundry of the money. Hmm. Yes. You say you cannot go back to Venezuela. No. No, from, not from, from until Maduro regime stops. So where does your hope lie at the moment? Where is my hope? You, where does your hope lie? What, what gives you hope, if, if anything gives you hope? Uh, of Venezuela's situation? Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, there are happening there are, there are some things in Venezuela, there are happening some things, uh, like a military man starts going to Colombia, to the Colombian side, and telling that they were like really, like really threatened out in Venezuela. Uh, until last month, uh, Venezuela people and the world sees the, the armed force, the, the army, uh, very strong about supporting Maduro. But from the last month till today, there have been like a lot of people going out there, their files, you know? So I think there is a hope. I see, I see Guaido, president, uh, like a hope. But they have to do what they have to do. They have to do things right. Because if they don't do things right, if people would, would probably get tired very fast in Venezuela because we had like 20 years listening that they are going to take out the, the government and they like uh, eat in the same table, you know? Mm -hmm. They are like friends and they both are having benefits of being in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Shall we ask the other members of, uh, of yes, the panel and have, uh, have a question. wider discussion? Nina? Yes. Rachel Rumay Diaz and Edwin Koopman. Will you sit here? I don't know. Will you sit here? I'm okay here. Right. <laughs> well, um, Nina, may I start with you? Uh, because in your lecture you, you already mentioned that you've been to Venezuela uh, over a longer period. Um, Ephraim says, it's always been bad in the Bolivarian Revolution. Um, and of course, there has been reporting about Venezuela over the years, but, but uh, the idea for a larger Dutch audience may be that this is a crisis. Something happened and now there's a crisis. Uh, what have you seen evolve over the years in Venezuela? Um, well, um, as I mentioned, um before, I, in 2005, when I came there for the first time, um, I didn't see a, the crisis like today. Uh, for me, the turning point was uh, 2015, I think, when I was in uh, Aruba. I saw thousands of Venezuelans going there. And normally in Venezuela, the, fe the story in Aruba, the Venezuelans who came there, they were very rich, they had second houses, or they came there uh, to do shoppings. But now I saw uh, the Fensons as uh, refugees uh, with uh, their suitcases uh, walking uh, to, um, uh, um, around the airport because they don't have any money for the bus or the taxi. And then in 2016, I was in uh, Venezuela after it was two or three years after Chavez uh, died. And for me, 
that was the first time that I really saw the, the impact of the, the crisis. And there, I think there was a longer period uh, before, but for me, personally, as a journalist, it was, uh, was 2015, 2016, uh, with the lines and with the shortages, I think that was uh, a very important moment. And also that you saw that um, uh, Maduro uh, lost all the grip on the economy and uh, that was the result of these years of nationalization that, that there was no food production in the country because mm -hmm. under Chavez, they bought uh, the food and the medicines, but then there were no dollars anymore because the prices were high. So, and they had no own production. So that, that was for me that I saw, wow, this is, and this is going be, uh, worse and worse. So yeah. for me, that was, I know. I think you are, you yes. live there. That was the last time I was like I was like uh, I can't even afford uh, my tennis shoes. That was the last time I bought some tennis shoes with my salary. You know, mm -hmm. like yeah. 2014. Yeah, uh -huh. and the inflation was was amazing. Deeper inflation started. The packages and, of yes, money in that the time. Money started. Uh -huh. Uh, Edwin, you have been uh, a, correspondent, a correspondent in Latin America for a long time, uh, and, and you went to Venezuela very often. You, you, you also have a long history with the Bolivarian Revolution. Um, one al analysis is that, that the oil disease that hit Venezuela, because they had so much oil, and the Chavez regime and Maduro regime uh, put all their cards on, on the oil incomes and neglected the rest of the economy. That whole strategy, that whole economic model collapsed when the oil prices went down uh, around 10 years ago. Is that, uh, is that uh, the main explanation for a crisis, or is it much more inherent to the regime? No, no. Uh, the, the, let's say the, the going down of the price of the oil made visible the crisis. The crisis has always been there, I think. I mean, the crisis is visible now, but the origins, the, the basis, the, the causes of the crisis were there from the beginning, from the day that Chavez took power. Because the aim of Chavez was never to save the country. Well, maybe he, is, he had some... To, to maintain it into power. So if we only see in 2002, then it's 16 years ago, they dismissed 18,000 people from the oil industry, which were technicians, uh, managers, uh, people who know, in uh, engineers, you know? So, and then they replaced them for people who didn't know anything about uh, oil. Um, they politicized the army, the judicial system, they closed, um, they closed the radio stations already eight or ten years ago. You know, RCTV, the, 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 the TV channel, was closed yeah. ten, eight years ago. So what I see is, main, meanwhile, the oil price was high, they were able to cover up all these problems, mm -hmm. which was the politicization of the economy also. Um, and the, the army was everywhere. So people who were loyal to the system were placed everywhere, in the economy, in the judicial system, in the media, everything. So the oil price was high and there was no, high, there was no problem. But when it went down, then you saw that there were pe these people were not capable to maintain the economy, the media, etc. And as for the claims, like, like I just asked Ephraim, of, uh, of uh, free education, uh, free healthcare, lifting people from, uh, from poverty, what have you seen? I've seen that this was, has been a method to keep the people voting for, for the party. Because all these, m most of the, what they call missions, which were the, the social programs for, for, the, for the poor, they were not started in 2000 or, or 1998, nine, when, uh, when Chavez came to power. They started, were started in 2004, when he saw that the next upcoming elections were going to be lost. Hmm. And then he started all these missions give peop money to the people, make uh, uh, the education free, etc. Uh, meals in the, in, the, in, the, in the schools for the children, uh, free, uh, uh, everything free. It was like giving, all, giving away the money, which was plenty of money because the oil price was high, mm -hmm. to buy the votes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's what I see. I mean, I, I, don't, I think that Chavez was also generally thinking of a sort of nice socialist idea at the end and, and, and give money to the people, like make the people part of, of the prosperous idea of the, of the oil revenues, because during decades, all these poor people were forgotten by the traditional system, by the traditional party. So Chavez came there as a hero. And he, I think he generally thought that these poor people had to be part of, of the richness of the system. But at the end, he, what he, 
what he should have done is invest the money of the, of the, of the oil. And he, did, he never invested it. He gave it away and it was just consumed. Hmm. Uh, Rachel, you're, uh, you're the next generation. You, uh, uh, what, what do your, uh, I, I guess you have a lot of family in, uh, in Venezuela. Yes, correct. And uh, you have nephews and nieces there that you communicate with. Yes. What are they telling you? What, what is their, what's their feeling about what's happening in Venezuela? Well, um, it's, 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 it's very different to uh, who you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, I have a very large family on the side of my mom and my dad. Um, but uh, my mother's family is very religious, so they're very hopeful. So, hope is really what makes them wake up every single day. So, every time we ask them what the situation is, um, the answer that we get is, you know, we're praying, we're being hopeful. Um, and it's very frustrating for us because, um, it's not very clear to what the situation is at that moment because they don't really want to speak about it. And it's kind of a, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a denial. It's actually living in denial because the truth is just too unbearable to speak out loud. And mm. telling us, of course, will only give us a lot more worry while we can't really help them. And then when it comes to the side of my uh, dad's family, they are very open to what, what is happening. And um, I think it's also very, um, it's very hard for Venezuelans in, in living in other countries because... Because um, they're living outside of Venezuela? Or? No, 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 no. For, for, for me as oh, a for Venezuelan, okay. living, yeah. not, not living in Venezuela, but having family there, mm. um, you know, you see so many things on social media and the desperation has really come to a, a point that people are sharing very uh, um, confrontational images on social media and videos, and like you, you, you see actually like dead people on Instagram, and people are sharing it, and it's actually a cry for help. So um, it, it, it really depends on who you're speaking to to really hear what the actual situation is. Yeah, uh, and you say they're very open um, from your father's side. Yes. Is that dangerous for them to communicate what, what they're experiencing? Uh, it is, it is actually. Uh, my father actually man manages my grandmother's account. So he makes sure that uh, because she's older and she's not able to mobilize as quickly because she's sick, um, he tries to um, control her account and pay her bills and make sure that she has everything that she needs. Uh, but now, um, the government is actually seeing that with your IP address from uh, another country that you're um, uh, having access to accounts. Um, it's, well, well, Maduro is actually prohibiting it now. So it's, it's definitely dangerous for them. It puts them in a situation that, um, you know, maybe the military could, can find out and go visit them at home mm -hmm. and then threaten them and ask them, like, you know, who do you know outside of Venezuela and who is helping you? And is, are, are people sending you money and putting money on your account? Mm -hmm. uh, Nina, um, you mentioned uh, that, that you were uh, at the border uh, yeah. when, when these... Uh, Convoys of humanitarian aid uh, arrived in, in at the border in Colombia. Um, the whole situation of the humanitarian aid has been politicized, has yeah, been highly totally. politicized yes. recently. And yes. I, I asked it you, but I yeah. would like you to reflect on it too. Um, did that help? My personal opinion, no. I think that uh, the way the United States um, made a whole show around this and uh, yeah, it was more politic than um, really humanitarian aid, I think. They used it as a weapon, as a way to uh, pressure um, Maduro. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was in Venezuela, uh, people were also talking about, uh, well, what, is our, what are the, the United States doing? Are they also maybe uh, forcing a uh, military in, uh, intervention? And well, some people said, well, it's now or never. They have to do it because there's no 
other uh, possibility because the opposition is trying for years and years. But I also spoke to a lot of people and they were not waiting for the Americans. They didn't like that. They said, no, we have to solve it. This is our own problem. This is our issue. And uh, in my opinion, the, the humanitarian aid, also the, the big show, the, the, the night before, mm-hmm. yeah, the, the Venezuelan uh, aid music show, mm-hmm. um, it had more uh, like... That was great, Richard Branson, yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah it was Richard Branson, it, yeah. and um, then Guaido came on a very, uh, well, secret way. He, he, en- he uh, entered the country. And I was also at the Las Chanditas Bridge uh, the day after. And there was Guaido with uh, the um, um, president of Colombia and uh, um, Chile. And people were outside waiting because they thought that he was going with them crossing the border because that's what he's, he told them. Well, we are, go- we are going to cross the border. But at the end, he was there waiting in the immigration uh, office and he was not doing anything. It were, at last, it was the people who were um, mm. on these trucks uh, taking the risk and Guaido was not talking to them. And that would also said a lot of angry blood. They, to- they, they told me, well, we are soldiers, but where is... Our, where's our general? Where's our general now? Mm-hmm. And he was only talking to other presidents. And so, um, in my opinion, the tactic of the United States, together with Guaido, maybe that was not uh, mm. the best way, because he had his momentum. But I think with the humanitarian aid and the way things go at that time, he lost also uh, a lot of things. How did you see that, Ephraim? And how did you experience it? Because you were still working there as a doctor at that time. Uh, trying to to find medicine, did okay. it did it help this show, as Nina puts it? Yes, I think it also like Nina, it was a, a political flag they tried to use against Maduro, but it gains against uh, it, it came against their their self, you know. Um, the humanitarian aid it, like worth things to NGOs because uh, when in the moment that they try to take it by the force. Uh, Venezuelan government spotlight went to the NGOs and the humanitarian aid, you know? They were like uh, taking some, they were like, they were no pay attention to the, to the humanitarian aid, and the humanitarian aid was entering by a little, but they was entering into the country. And before uh, these things happened on the, at the border, they stopped like sending anything to inside Venezuela. They like stop the peers, they stop everything, they stop the customs, and they stop the, the flowing of medicines inside Venezuela. I think the, the, this situation makes worse the Venezuelan situation. It was counterproductive. Counterproductive, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ed, Edwin, um, uh, I, I have been, uh, ever since it was announced that I would moderate this evening, uh, I have, well, I can't say bombarded, but I, I've been uh, sent. Uh, some emails trying to tell me that uh, this whole situation uh, is in fact caused by the Americans. Uh, That we know the history of the Americans in Latin America and that it is in fact uh, mostly the sanctions, the American sanctions that have caused this situation because there are sanctions which are directly focusing on uh, not uh, exporting medicine to, to, to Venezuela. Okay. That's, that's details, but th- this whole narrative, given the role that the, the United States are, are playing in, uh, in this field now, how do you see that? Well, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, we have these new sections which were put into, uh, into uh, effect uh, a couple of months ago. Yeah. They were the, the first sanctions yeah. started in 2015, I think, yeah, exactly. under Obama. Yeah, and yeah. these were not sanctions which could bring down an economy because we were talking about uh, the, the prohibition of, of, of uh, tr- uh, trading um, uh, bonds from PDVSA, the, the state's oil company. And there were um, a, a long list of sanctions towards individuals of, of, the, of the government, like high-ranking officials. Um, many of them which were um, suspected of drug trafficking. So, uh, I mean, this was uh, strong sanctions towards these people, but this was not enough to bring down an economy or to even cause uh, the lack of food or medicines in Venezuela. 
Hmm. So I've seen these comments also that like with a sort of uh, <laughs> retrospective uh, way uh, the, the Americans were like made responsible for uh, for the whole crisis in the uh, in uh, in Venezuela after 20 years of boycott, which is I mean I don't I, I would like to know which sanctions they refer to because they are not, they were not there. It, it, it's it's more the United States during all these years were the most loyal oil buyers from uh, from Venezuela. I mean, the, the, the major parts of the of the oil production were, were sold to the to the United States. So I mean, they were in fact financing the whole revolution all the time. Like yes. 80%, I think. Yeah. Like the 80 percent of the petroleum we we produce, we sell it so, to the Americans yeah. because they pay with cash, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Huh? Yeah, because the other uh, oil, a lot of the oil of Venezuela goes to China and Russia. In India, they pay, they paying uh, um, the debts they have there. So a lot of the, the cash money comes from the United States. Uh -huh. For yeah. Cuba, it's for yes. free. Yeah. For Cuba, it's for free. It's for free. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, what, what do you feel about this kind of uh, criticism, which comes uh, in, in a country like Holland, uh, mostly from, from left-oriented people okay. who think that uh, that uh, this is another uh, imperialist ploy to uh, to stall a socialist experiment they're also criticizing the maduro regime it's not yes. that black and white but yes, yes. Um, and and given the role the united states is playing now and 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 the words we hear from the white house and and, and the state department and people like elliot abrams who is now uh, 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 the, the, yeah, the regisseur of, of the American foreign policy towards Venezuela. How do you see it? A very difficult question you made me. Uh, I think the United States is like talking a lot about Venezuela, but they are really actually doing nothing about that. They like send some humanitarian aid to the border, but they are not doing anything more than that and take, taking some tweets on Twitter, making some tweets. Uh, I don't think the United States is really like taking inside Venezuela problem because the sanctions were individually, like, like Edwin says, uh, and the, 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 this deterioration of the system starts before, the, before the, they get the sanction. The, the sanctions are like for people that really are into terrorism, into, into drug uh, smoke, trafficking. Mm -hmm. And now they are broader, of course, and now it's, it's kind of stopping all financial traffic uh, yes. from the Venezuelan government. For the Venezuelan government, but uh, if you see the sanctions, uh, they are still having a, an, an income from the gold, the coltan, and the gas trafficking, and in, even people traffic during, during, uh, through the border. Uh, and I think it's a very hard situation because mm -hmm. cocaine is still moving uh, around Venezuela. And if you, say they, if you say they're not really interested, they're not really doing anything, would you want them to do more? Uh, I don't think I don't want them to do more. I think like uh, everybody around the world should be aware of what, what is happening in Venezuela so we can all do like in, in a, with a, you know, it's like a very romantic thought, but it's like uh, we need everybody around the world to, to, to step forward and talk about Venezuela, you know? Because we like, uh, we have to stop them because there are no socialism, there are no left-wing uh, thinkers, there are nothing. Mm -hmm. There are like terrorists that are making my people have very bad, bad time. They don't have uh, any kind of, of knowledge of what they are trying to do, you know? I think Maduro probably would haven't read a book in his life, a complete book in his life. <laughs> the only book Maduro reads every day is Facebook. <laughs> but I, I don't think, I mean, Nina? I think uh, this is not only about Venezuela, it's also a bigger well, picture. The region, right. I mean, yeah, also the region, but yes. also China and Russia who are uh, helping Maduro and the army, which is still uh, behind him until now. I mean, if uh, the United States um, they, well, uh, Trump said uh, every option is on the table, but the Latin American countries, even the, the right or like we have in Brazil, the ultra right, they don't, they don't, don't want uh, a uh, military intervention. And as long as China and, and Russia are, are helping, are putting money in Venezuela, I think Maduro will be still there. I think this is a much bigger picture than only Venezuela. It's, it's, and, and only Maduro against uh, Guaido or Maduro against 80% uh, of the people. It's, it's, 
it's a bigger thing. And the fact that it's bigger, does it make does that more make complex. it more complicated yes, of for, course. More for complicated, Venezuela? Yes, because we can all uh, hope that. Um, I mean, I was there when Guaido announced him, proclaimed himself uh, the, the interim president and um, the second uh, manifestation, I think you were there also, the 2nd of February. There was like a, a whole energy. People were thinking, wow, today it's, uh, he is, um, we are free. And, but that energy is now, I think it's getting lower, getting lower because getting lower. the bigger yeah. picture is there. And I think that that will be, uh, at the end, uh, this, there will be the solution. That's yeah. my opinion. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I no, can no. add yeah. some, to some uh, yeah. short. Um, what I found striking in uh, talking to people last month in these, in these demonstrations is that when you talk to these people, well, there were hundreds of thousands of them on the street, and you ask them, what do you think of, of possible uh, in intervention of the United States? And even go further, if it were military intervention, what would you think? And then at the end, even if they don't like it, Almost everybody said, yes, I, I think I would, I would agree with that. So that's the level of this, this is this, desperation. Desperation. Despair. Uh, people have reached already. Is that what you hear well, too, Rachel? Yeah, yeah. people are, are really, uh, uh, they're really asking for military intervention. Yeah, and they're actually claiming it. And um, the, <coughs> the people who are for Guaido are now turning against him because they are, um, they, they really want the military intervention and because it's not happening, they're turning against him and saying, well, this is gonna fail. And <coughs> it's, 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 a, it's a difficult question to answer because mm. it is, th yeah. there's a, a bigger picture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But <coughs> if you have to uh, choose between two lesser evils, um, yeah. there, there's mm -hmm. people yes. like dying, yes. children mm -hmm. dying every single day. People are starving. Hmm. Um, like, what, what, what is the right thing to do in, in, in this situation? Then you're not so much interested in no. geopolitical complications. No. Okay. Well, I, no, definitely, I do understand. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, uh, I wouldn't want the U.S. to, uh, to go to Venezuela because um, if, if, if we look at other countries where this has exactly the same has happened, like Iraq and mm. countries like that, um, it's, it's, it's not the best for the country. But at this point, maybe right now, this could be the only thing that could save the people. And the people are really in need of help. Okay. We are going to elaborate further on this. And, and I want okay. to focus on uh, the Dutch situation because we're, we're neighbors of Venezuela through our borders in, uh, in the Dutch Caribbean. But uh, Rachel, you are a poet and a spoken yes. word artist. And yes. you're, you prepared something for tonight. So. Yes. Please, Thank you. take the lectern. The body can survive three minutes without air, three days without water, three weeks without food. The body can wrap its limbs around itself and trick the mind into feeling loved, hold its breath for decades in weight of something that will never happen. The body can coat its tongue with ice and watch its frosted muscle forget all its memories. No hay mal que dure cien años ni cuerpo que lo resista. There is no evil that can last for a hundred years or a body that can resist it. What is a country but the map of a body? My rib cage home to the largest city, a capital that pumps blood through all that is of me. Caracas, la ciudad herida, the wounded city. I bleed yellow, blue, and red if you cut me. My lungs vast and wide like el campo, the countryside. My tears sweet like the Orinoco River when they run down my cheeks. I cry the sounds of the arp, the galloping horses, the snares of a guitar. My eyes sing the anthem of the land, alma llanera, soul of the plains. What is a body but the map of a country? How do the scars on my body not form islands? Once outlined by borders that drew blood that gave the soil its color. 
Isla Margarita, Pearl of the Caribbean, battleground of someone else's war. How do the R's that roll on my tongue not cascade out of me like El Salto Angel, tallest waterfall in the world, baptized by my forefathers in a language that was erased? How am I not La Gran Sabana, El Coro, Morrocoy, all of these landmarks of my country, all of these part of me? How does a body live if its country is dying? left an empty shell unable to lick its wounds, a prisoner of powerlessness. Where do you rest your head when home is a place where no house can be built? My mouth echoes the remnants of what is left of si se puede. Yes, we can. But all you can is wish for hope to come back. My heart beats to a rhythm that hasn't been made into a song for decades. I can't remember the words, but I know it's Alma Llanera because my soul is still lingering in the plains. How does a body mourn the death of a country without mourning its own life? 20 years without air, six days without water, every day without food. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, how does the, the, the Venezuelan community here in the Netherlands react to what's, what's happening? What's happening here in the Venezuelan community? Um, well, there are not a lot of Venezuelans in the Netherlands, um, at least. Um, there, there is a very strong community, um, but it's not a really big community. So um, we do have a very strong online community and um, we are definitely sharing news. So um, living here means every single day sharing everything that's going on. Videos or pictures or any type of news is shared with everyone on an online platform. And we are always looking for foundations or um, uh, any type of organization that we can donate money to, um, donate clothing, uh, medicine is very difficult, but we do have a lot of contacts in uh, Spain because uh, Spain is, is aware of the situation in Venezuela. So there are a lot of cities where you can actually go to the pharmacy and say, okay, I need to buy these medicines and I don't have a recipe like you have to have here in the Netherlands, but it's for the people in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. And then they will actually sell it to you. Mm -hmm. So it's possible to send it through a package. And, and that's the kind of medicine that ends up with people yes. like Jeffrey. Yes, yes. Right. exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, whether it's um, donating to people who buy the medicine or maybe sending the package yourself. So we actually try to buy the medicine through someone we know in Spain and then that person sends it to our family. But it's always a risk mm -hmm. because um, you're not sure that it's actually going to arrive. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the way that we try to, to really help out. Yeah. Now, um, the Netherlands is only 60 kilometers uh, away from uh, Venezuela, um, the kingdom of the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's your idea of how the Dutch government is reacting to uh, the crisis in, in, in Venezuela? And especially the way they operate on, on Curaçao. Your father comes from Curaçao. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not very aware of, um, well, what I do know is what the people of Curaçao, um, um, what, what, what their opinion is about the situation. And I think the island has always benefited from Venezuela uh, through, you know, trade. Um, uh, Curaçao is not a, uh, an island where you can grow a lot of vegetables and fruit. So, um, the, the, the people from Curaçao would benefit from the Venezuelan fishermen who would go to the island mm. and sell all types of food and, and fresh fruit and uh, Curaçao people would go to Venezuela and actually buy clothing. So it was, we, we had a very good relationship with each other. And right now that they are aware of the situation in Venezuela, the people want to help. 
um, and they want to collaborate in any ways that they can. But um, it's 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 difficult when the, the the government here in the Netherlands is saying that they want to, and the government in Curacao is saying that they don't want to help. So it's it's kind of a clash of mm. you know what what the right thing is to do. Because Nina, you you also have roots in in Curacao. Um, what's your estimate of of the situation there? There seems to be. Uh, like Rachel says, a distinction between the population and, and the government. Let's start with the government of Curaçao. Yeah. Um, we, we hear stories of refugees being sent back, for instance. Yes. Well, the thing is that uh, Curaçao didn't uh, sign a refugee agreement. So uh, I think that's very important. That's because, um, well, because they didn't sign that, they uh, don't recognize the refugee the defense ones as refugees. Um, and so the refugees, the defense ministers who come there, they put them or in uh, in jail, or they they deported them. So um, right now there is a blockade. So the well, the border is is closed since uh, some um, I think some well some some weeks when uh, that was during the, the um, when they tried to get uh, the help uh, yeah. in the country. Venezuela so the border, closed the border. Yeah, yeah. Closed border. So that's why at this time there's a lot of people in this uh, jail. Mm. And I heard that this weekend they, they freed the people because the jail was too crowded. Overcrowded. Mm. Yeah. But mm. the thing is that um, Curaçao has a status apart. So they are part of the, of the kingdom. But the Netherlands said, well, foreign um, affairs is their own business. Yeah. And um, in my opinion, the Netherlands is a little bit uh, looking away from this whole problem because I think when they because sit we, together, the Netherlands, yeah. we did sign these treaties. Yes, and also there is treaties. in uh, there are uh, laws that also they should help Curaçao with this to solve mm -hmm. this problem. So um, I think it's easy for the Netherlands to just say, "Well, this is your own problem, um, yeah, do it by yourself," but. The, the situation is that while the whole region is helping, is trying to help the, the Venezuelans, there are three million. Colombia, who has a problem of his own, their history of uh, uh, civil war of 50 years with four million refugees themselves, they are helping now a lot of Venezuelans. Mm -hmm. Brazil also. I think that uh, at least the Netherlands could help Curaçao to, to think maybe of a new model of this problem. because people coming by boats. I've been to this coast of Falcon, and it's really terrible. They are in, in fisher boats uh, for, for 15, there's places for 15 people. There were 30 uh, people on these boats. People are dying on the sea. So mm. uh, they're more and more desperate now. So this problem will get huger and huger. So mm. I think the Netherlands has a responsibility. Mm. Well, on the other hand, Edwin, uh, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, Stef Bloch, was pretty quick to offer uh, the Americans to use Curaçao as a hub for uh, humanitarian aid, which seems like a little bit of a conflicting strategy. Have we, have we been cozying up to the American agenda too much there? And should we, should we focus much more on helping refugees? What's your, what's yeah, your take? Well, I, th I think it's more, more easy to, uh, to make uh, Curaçao part of this, uh, of this supposed uh, humanitarian aid, which I still doubt I agree with, uh, with Nina, if this is really the idea of the United States to help the Venezuelan people with this. But, uh, but anyway, uh, it's more easy to do this than to help refugees. Uh, obviously, the problem is far too big for, the, for Curaçao. We are not talking about, about tens of thousands, but there are uh, too much people for these uh, small islands. And it, maybe the idea behind, the, uh, behind, uh, not behind looking away was to discourage uh, refugees uh, to come to the Curaçao. And I think uh, in this way it, it worked. Another thing is this humanitarian aid, um, so-called humanitarian aid, uh, which they probably know that Maduro will never accept because he cannot accept it. Mm -hmm. So it's like gratuit, no? To say, yeah. okay, we will, uh, we will offer. How are they going? How are they going to, 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 to bring these things it's an empty with gesture. a catapult yeah. or something? I mean, uh, Maduro <laughs> will never agree this, mm -hmm. and uh, and so they were wise to say, okay, we only bring it to Venezuela as soon as the government allows us to bring it in knowing that they will never do it. Yeah. And the people so, don't want it. Eh? I talked to a lot of people in Curaçao, and they are really afraid. They, say they don't want 
be part of this because they say, well, of the geopolitical oh, yes, side of it. Yes, mm -hmm. and they say, well, why d um, does Steve Block not send this uh, help to Bonaire, which is a special uh, um, uh, gemeente of, yeah, the, of the Netherlands? Where he has jurisdiction. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I mean, why don't they do that? Why to Curaçao? They are not happy with it. People I spoke, mm -hmm. there is a lot of people who want to help, really, but to. Um, to uh, put a hub, a humanitarian hub, on Curaçao, a lot of people are afraid of that. Yeah. Is there enough interest in Dutch politics uh, for the situation in Venezuela? We, the, the Bali asked uh, five MPs to, to attend tonight. Um, they were all busy. Uh, <laughs> well, I know there's a football match on, but um, is there enough interest in Holland uh, in Dutch politics for the situation in Venezuela? I throw it. Well, you, you, on the I table. think, but yeah, well, but now we're talking about the bigger problem. I think, in general, Latin America is not an issue in the Dutch politics. And then, but Latin you, America is not. Latin okay. America in general, yes. Uh, but then you would expect that Venezuela, being like a neighboring country of the kingdom, uh, would cause more interest. And then also in, in policy papers, Venezuela is often, oftenly mentioned as the, the our entrance to well, in the past, yeah. our entrance to Latin America, etc. All these nice words. But now, uh, now we could do something, and, and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. um, I've, there's been some meetings in the past in Parliament uh, when, uh, when uh, Venezuelan dissidents came, organized by D66. So uh, I think this, if we have to mention one part, it was still a little bit interested in, in, this, in, in the problem, in the crisis in Venezuela. It would be Schurzema, maybe. Yeah, but, they but, yeah, they six, six, yeah, exactly. But, uh, but further than that, I mean, he's not here now, so no. yeah. It's, I don't know it's if like, they asked him, but... Okay, <laughs> well, anyway, uh, yeah, it's disappointing. Hmm. Yeah, and, and also I think that, that yeah. the Netherlands, uh, I mean, I also asked this question to, uh, for example, the Dutch ambassador in Venezuela. Why is this so, are you so passive in this whole thing? You are uh, the biggest neighbor, actually, or the most powerful neighbor. Hmm. And then they say, well, we do everything in, uh, in, uh, in the European Union uh, construction. So that's a lot of time what the Netherlands said. Everything yeah, yeah, is yeah. in the European... Hide uh, behind the European yes, Union. Yes, and I think that's too easy, because you could also um, uh, start to, to do something and mm -hmm. start at least to, to sit with Curaçao and try to think, okay, what kind of agreement uh, can we do for uh, can we m m m yeah. At the same time, I, I would like one little point. We're talking about the government policy now, but uh, yeah. I, I think there is a small exception in terms of, of, the, of the foreign ministry, because when you go to the to Dutch embassy in, in Caracas, they're really active with everything. Okay. So yeah, supporting, they're active, but Supporting not. dissidency, uh, yeah. being informed about it. They're, I mean, they're okay. really working hard and doing okay. good, uh, good things. Yeah, so, yeah, that's on, on Den Haag uh, le uh, level, yeah. I think that okay. they are saying, well... Efren, can I reveal this little secret that I found out about your agenda just when we had dinner? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> yeah, no <it's> okay. Okay. <laughs> because yeah, yeah, you're, going to, you're going to visit the, the foreign ministry. Yes. What are you yeah. going to tell them? Uh, well... I think uh, the, the best thing I, I can do is to tell him to help us to solve. <laughs> I, I will f probably figure it out in the, in the next hours, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think I'm going to ask him to, to help us, like uh, to, to, to remain the important people in Venezuela, like uh, professional people and doctors, and, and to, to help them not to, to to escape from Venezuela, because if everybody takes out Venezuela, there is going to be a lot of worse situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, help people that is actually inside Venezuela and is still fighting is from the inside, like to help them to help other people, you know? So that so, would be very direct support, and like direct support. Lord, what Edwin is saying, maybe through the embassy through or... Through the embassy, through the NGOs, like through, like, like he, she said, or, or says, like, like in the, well, I'm sorry. Yeah, she just said that Rachel, you have to, yes. Rachel just said that if you send medicine in Venezuela in small packages, they pass through the border, you know? Through the door-to-door through the -door -door system, they, they can send uh, small packages of medicine, and that is a way the, uh -huh. like, Holland can help us, you know? Uh -huh. And for the bigger picture, we, we were talking about the geopolitical complications yes. there, and, and, and the American position, and... What would you want to see happen? Uh, well, the, I think the, the, what all Venezuelans wants to see is Maduro uh, going away 
telling the people the truth, exactly. that they can, uh, they can actually uh, go, take a government of Venezuela, take the control of the, politi the political and the economical situation, and go away other place, you know? That's what Venezuela loves to see in a peaceful way, in a civilized way, but we, like, we don't expect that happening any soon because mm -hmm. the, the, the signs they show people is that they are not going to make it in the peaceful way, but in a, in a very aggressive way. And in, like, there are, like, like they, don't, they don't matter if, if a war starts in Venezuela, you know? They are mm -hmm. willing to do the work they have to do to stay in the power. And, and uh, this, this whole situation of the, of the recent uh, weeks and months was because uh, Juan Guaido took this step of yes. declaring himself uh, interim president. Um, Nina said, I'm afraid his momentum is, uh, is, uh, is getting lost. Are you okay. still hopeful that he can, he can play a role? I think every, a, any Venezuela can, can play a role in this change. I think we all have to play our role and do something about that because if we only stay with our arm crossed, we can do we don't do nothing, you know. We have to to take uh, the step forward and tell the truth about Venezuela, and try to make something from your from your own personal experience, you know. If everybody in Venezuela and outside Venezuela like uh, make a little push, we can push them out, you know. They are very in a very bad situation right now. From Venezuelan people, it's like deciding who is going to kill you, this murder or this other murder, you know? In all situations, in all the other situations, uh, with Maduro staying in power, there is going to be dead people. Mm -hmm. If military US people at attack, or if they don't attack, there, there is always going to be dead people in Venezuela, you know? And that's what makes us, and uh, does not have have a lot of hope about what's ha going to happen in Venezuela, because in the most of the cases, we think that there's going to be people killed in Venezuela hmm. for the crisis or for other foreign affairs or, or situations, you know? Yeah. One, yeah, one thing that could happen is if the military in Venezuela said there's not going to be any more dead people, mm. do, you could see start any, do you see any movement in that direction? That, that could start a civil war because a Maduro regime has a lot of paramilitary groups inside Venezuela, including the, the Colombian guerrilla and terrorist cells around the south of so the country. So even a shift in the army would not be the, the, not the be, end of could, the crisis? Could not be the end of the crisis, right. Mm. I, that was, um, that's, it's a, it scares us because they can start like a civil war and it's, it's can, it can get worse, you know? Sometimes people in Venezuela, they, this, this can get worse, but it can get worse. Mm -hmm. So we are very, very concerned about that. Hmm. Yes. Before we conclude uh, with these dark words, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> the truth must be spoken. Um, I want to give the audience the room to ask questions. Hi. Hi. Uh, starting with Frank, no te conozco, pero desde hoy eres mi pana. Um, a couple of things here. Uh, education, public education is established in Venezuela since 1870. Okay. So it was not a creation of Chavez. I myself, I am the result of public education my whole life. <coughs> Okay. And it was even, uh, I arrived to the Netherlands actually two weeks after Chavez took the power. So we cannot get confused that these people create public education or public whatever, yes. because it was already for was a long already, time yeah. in the country. Oh. Uh, also, it, on regards the awareness of the Netherlands, in the last couple of months, since January 23, uh, Dutch media is giving us more attention, so uh, access to the newspaper, radio, TV. So there is kind of movement, mm. and we are very uh, hopeful that it's going to ring a bell also to the political uh, sector. And last but not least, uh, we have uh, been talking with politicians from our platform on Facebook since the last four years. 
five years, five. we have very often talking with different levels of politicians uh, in the Netherlands, and they always say, well, the situation is okay. So uh, our conclusion is that the diplomacy times is much slower than the real human uh, times. Okay. But Efraín, gracias por lo que has hecho. No, thank you for the work. Thank you very much. That was not a question, but thank you for your remark. <laughs> uh, is there anybody with a question? Can I say something? Yeah, sure, Efraín, go uh, ahead. I think uh, you, are, uh, you, you get in the nail with that, with that comment because uh, I think I'm here for a reason, because I think that uh, Netherlands like, turned his side to me and to Venezuela's situation because of Tuki Jenko, a uh, great movie. Mm -hmm. I first have to thank him about all of this because without him, I wouldn't be, be able to be here uh, to speak out loud for Venezuela people, you know? And so I think that I start see, seeing a change in, like, in the Dutch people and in the Netherlands, like seeing to Venezuela people like, hey, they're, they're really a problem for the world and we can help some of them with some little changes in our policy. So I think I'm here for a reason and I have to be to appreciate your invitation. The Bali may, is making something for Venezuela right now in this moment. And uh, I really appreciate me for having, he, for having me here. You know? I really appreciate you all for listening what we have to say to the world. And it's an honor for me of being here. It's our pleasure. Hi. Hi. So, you want to go? Okay. Um, my question is, um, so, if, I mean, war apparently is not really desirable, and I think there's no example in history where the forceful removal of uh, a leader in a country, even if it was a dictator, uh, led to a peaceful existence afterwards. So, usually the country is messed up for decades, right? So, I'm wondering, is there anything... Um, on the table that can be discussed with peaceful means. I know that there is a proposal by, the Uru by Uruguay to uh, do anything just to put Maduro back on the table to talk to Latin American countries because they're also quite divided in how they're going to deal with Venezuela. And so the Uruguayan government um, said that they would talk to Maduro and make it not conditional upon him leaving the country uh, or him leaving the government, right? So it's the only proposal that is non -con not conditional on this. And I'm wondering if you think that this could maybe be a peaceful way of at least, you know, establishing negotiations again and to help the people and avoid war. Is there any negotiable solution? Okay, I think that from the inside, they have a lot of an internal opposition right now. They have like a really a lot of Chavistas that are turning around Maduro and telling him to, to stop doing what he was doing. But I, I think that that would be a hope, like you said, like military from the inside take over Maduro, to, to, they show back to Maduro and, and start another, like another military government, you know? But it, at, at, la, at last we see things very difficult in Venezuela because any of the options is with a lot of debts, even the peaceful options, implies to wait until diplomacy uh, function and make something about Venezuela problem. And the problem in Venezuela is that in each hour uh, we, lo we lost a Venezuela patient because of the lack of dialysis, you know? Really people, real people is getting, is getting dead in Venezuela like uh, every day at the streets, at the hospitals, at their houses because of the lack of the of complete absence of, of all the medicines and the materials, you know? There are some, some materials that are being uh, bought in Turkey and, all, and, all, and other countries like Russia and China. They are arriving in Venezuela, but when we try to afford them on the pharmacies, they are very expensive medicines. Like uh, some painkiller can cost you four or five times your salary. So you can even take some pills for a headache, you know? It's a difficult situation for us because, like, we have like five years we haven't been able of of take outside the poverty. You know, when you tell me that the Chavez regime take people out of the poverty, I was thinking like uh, I wasn't telling you, I was asking. Okay, <laughs> like I feel I feel like uh, no, it's the opposite. You know, like eight million people enter to the poverty, including me, including me because. Uh, 
me as a doctor in Venezuela, I can just get like $10 a month and that's like a, the price of one meal. Hmm. And it's very difficult for me to see that, that I have to ask to, for my family, to, for my family like to provide me some food because I am not able to make it with my work, with my studies, with my, you know, with the thing I have, I, the only thing I know how to make for living, you know? Mm. For the last 10 years I have been doing medicine, studying medicine, that's the center of my life. And because of the Maduro regime fired me, I have to stop that activity like last year. It was a difficult year because I was, I kind of uh, turned myself to an activist to an uh, uncover activist. So, but you'd rather be a doctor? I dropped to be, a, I can't be a doctor in Venezuela anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like an activist, I, this year I help more people than, than it would be like, an, like in a doctor way. Yeah. But uh, I'm going to be with this situation, helping people from the outside until I can do it. Because I think that, because I think that from the outside, being in a safe position, I can have more people than in Venezuela in a dangerous position. You know. Okay, I I don't know if it was a direct answer to your question about the Uruguayan <laughs> proposal. I'm not aware of that proposal, so I cannot help you there. Well, can I? I well, Sorry, Nina. Yeah. 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 So uh, there were uh, for years negotiations between uh, Maduro and the opposition in the Dominican Republic. Uh, Republic for years, and that was clashed. Mm -hmm. um, so that was before this whole thing started with uh, Guaido and, and uh, um, the. Um, what I know is that other the other um, countries from uh, I think the Organization of American States they don't want any negotiations anymore. I know this plan of uh, I think it's it's Uruguay and also Mexico, right? It's that it's a uh, it's it's a more countries. Um, I don't know, because uh, maybe if uh, they find out that the situation now is a status quo, they go back to the negotiation uh, table. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because I think that th the idea was that it would be a very fast transition. Guaido, and then that the military would um, um, yeah, uh, yeah. Leave, uh, leave Maduro. Now that we are in this situation, maybe they go back. I don't know. It's, okay. We have to see that. There was another question. And for Efraim, uh, gracias por lo que haces. When you, when Chavez took the power, you were 10 years old, so you didn't yes. know actually Venezuela, as I we was. others knew it. So it was a great country before. And I want to tell you that you are not alone. In every situation when a Venezuelan is out of the country, we are also fighting for the same than you. So what you do is touch our heart. Um, same as the re-clarification that about the, the oil, I hear a lot that Chavismo nationalized the industry. That's not true. Uh -huh. That was nationalized in 76 by the President Carlos Andres Carlos Perez. Andres. So that's a lie and a propaganda of the regime. Yes. And a question for you is, after 23 of January, have you feel the pressure from the military forces or police getting harder or softer? Because we saw on TV in, in, the, in the manifestation for the first time that it was not such a big repression how is living that in the hospital? Do you feel that they are understanding better that the changing is coming or is getting harder there? Uh, just this week, uh, three other doctors, activist doctor, doctor gets in jail and they get like uh, robbed, tortured, uh, their passport was broken and they cannot uh, get them some charges so they can go out of the country. Uh, Olivares deputy, like uh, six or eight months ago, like uh, called me to to like coordinate a general strikes of, of doctors because of the crisis. Uh, immediately before we even speak out loud in the conference press, uh, Olivares was like called and her her his mother, his brother, and his wife was threatened of being getting getting in jail. So he, without, uh, with his newborn son, that was three months uh, of, of birth, uh, he has to go to Colombia through the river without making either, uh, without taking the passport of his son because they like, in Simon, in the, in the, in the Ministry of, of Identification in Venezuela, they like uh, can, can steal from you too to, 
$5,000, dollars, American dollars, for giving you a passport, you know? Mm. So they like, um, Olivares like pay the money and they don't give him the passport of his son, so he escaped from the regime. Mm. Now he's safe. I think he's on the, on the States or in Colombia, helping with the humanitarian aid and, and working with the World Health, Health Organization. I met Olivares at, at Vargas School. I worked with him like for six or seven years. Uh, and I think he's, he's doing a great job, like uh, making it public, but we can make humanitarian aid in Venezuela, make a political propaganda because we lost the, the, the punch of the help, you know? We lost like the, the real, the really, uh, the really, the, the importance of help people, you know? If you help people to be famous, you, you are not helping people, you are becoming famous, you know? And that's very bad. Yeah, but in general, I think your answer is that it, the oppression has become more severe and not severe lighter. And not lighter, uh -huh. right? Yeah, in the public, uh, in the public manifestations, you see like le less tear gas and less effect effective uh, military effective because there are less now in Venezuela. A lot of them also escape and deserted from the military army, from the military lines. You know, mm -hmm. they escape to Colombia through Brazil. Uh, without saying nothing. Uh, uh, we don't even have uh, numbers in Venezuela because there, there is like a, an internal policy not to gather any information, any statistics of nothing. Hmm. They have been like, for the last five to 10 years, they have like been uh, hiding everything and not to take uh, statistics of nothing because if you don't have a statistic, that, that doesn't exist, you know? You don't have the statistic, you are, you are nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have that numbers, uh, we don't know even what what is our population or what are our, our, our how many like military people are still in Venezuela, and they don't publish that anymore. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one more question over there okay. in the back. Yeah, it's a long way. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, a general comment, uh, I do agree to say that we, from the Netherlands we are a bit turning the head away uh, in terms of what's happening in Venezuela. Um, just yesterday, an oil tanker just departed the east coast of Venezuela and it's on its way to Rotterdam, just to say uh, trade has not stopped with Venezuela. And rig uh, despite everything that's happening. But uh, my question goes uh, to both journalists on the, on the panel. Um, and it's about the politicized humanitarian aid. Uh, it, is, it is a fact that uh, it has been taken a bit of a political show from uh, many countries, many parties. But uh, also Ephraim talks about smuggling this uh, uh, humanitarian aid through NGOs and little by little. So um, the UN Commission has recently been in Venezuela making reports about uh, the humanitarian crisis, uh, also about the violation of human rights, and uh, for journalists as well, uh, violation of uh, journalist rights. And uh, for you that have been there and actually get uh, really scrutinized on every move you make, uh, how do you think that uh, a full humanitarian aid can get into the country because uh, it could be made as a show, but the little by little through NGOs or door-to-door uh, -door, uh, deliveries won't cut what's happening there. So what's your view on it? Okay, Nina first, yeah. how, how could humanitarian aid, without solving the whole crisis uh, at once, but how could we try to get more humanitarian aid on a bigger scale into the country? Well, I think it's very important that the International Red Cross and the international organizations, also the United, uh, United Nations, are backing this. They, for example, didn't back the last uh, show of the, uh -huh. <laughs> the United States. But this that, UN report that you, she's referring to, yes. Sorry? The UN report that she's referring to, or? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, yeah I think. Almost like yesterday, I think. Yes, yes, yeah, so I think that if they are, uh, yeah, um, organize it with that, and uh, maybe also, yeah, maybe it's controversial, but um, 
uh, I think that humanitarian aid should not be political. And therefore, maybe you should also deal with the enemy. I mean, um, which is maybe also political, but it's important that the aid is there and that also, you say this tonight uh, several times, there's people dying right now. So uh, you know that better, but that's also what I saw. So mm -hmm. I think um, maybe we should disorganize b besides of the whole political uh, situation without uh, or the states or, or Russia, but with an international um, organization and that countries participate because the, f the food is there. Right now it's at the border, uh -huh. but it's with a stamp of USAID. So it's very frustrated also yeah. that it's so close for the people. Maybe your last word on that, Efrain? Well, I'd like to, to add that, in fact, um, humanitarian aid is entering uh, Venezuela yes. already. I mean, it's not true that, uh, that uh, Maduro is blocking everything. Uh, in the past two years, it's been like $120 million in, uh, in, like, in value. It's come into the country with the permission of the government by the Red Cross, uh, by an European and even American uh, NGOs, and also uh, governments. Um, the problem is, I mean, I think the, the idea behind this is it, it was not in front of the cameras, it's uh, hidden, it's not published, and that's yeah. the way they accept it. The problem is it was 120 million, it, it's like uh, the amount of food that a country can eat in uh, two weeks, so it's just in, uh, that in two years, so it's not enough, mm -hmm. it's just a, it's a fragment, a, a smart part of what uh, Venezuela needs, but uh, if there would be more, behind the scenes, not, uh, let's not, say, not in the spotlight, then there would be a possibility to, to increase. If, the, if there are more donations and if the, the, the NGOs and the governments uh, would put uh, more attention. Efrem, your last words on this? Uh, yes. Uh, of, of that, I just, I just can say that the church also helps, helps a lot in Venezuela. It's like really into the problem because people is starving around their churches and they are really helping people. And, and other big NGOs around the world are making the same. Like, you have to, to do it like Edwin says, like in-, in Behind the scenes. Behind, behind the scenes, scenes. without low being key, on key. the spotlight, without being on Twitter or- Don't politicize on, on, it. On, on Instagram, because like Maduro regime is, is, is like always surveilling the network, the social media network. Mm -hmm. And when they see something went viral, they start attacking them to take it out of the- of the only spaces we still have freedom uh, or like uh, uh, freedom of speech in Venezuela, no? You know, it's the social network where we can express ourselves until, until the regime starts uh, like, are like surveilling you like they made with me the last year. Okay. Yes. Well, we, I don't think we can end this evening on a really hopeful note. Okay. Um, let me only say that my biggest hope for this moment is that you can be reunited with your wife as soon as possible. Yes, that's my, that's my, um, my, my biggest dream right now. Yes. yes. Thank you very, very much for your courage. Thank the panel, Edwin Koopman, uh, Rachel Rumay Diaz, Nina Yuna, Efraim Vegas, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank 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 you.